image that I've uh, used before. I don't think I've used it in this class. Uh, it takes off from Heraclitus' statement that uh, you cannot step into the same river twice, thinking of time and the passage of time as being a river. And I maintain that, that is, while that is uh, obviously true, it is very important when you do step into the river, uh, whether you are facing upstream or downstream. And historians uh, face downstream. They don't know what's going on, but they see it as it passes them. Uh, the turbidity of the water, the ripples, the currents, the flotsam and jetsam floating along, maybe a fish jumping or something. And they see the pattern as it flows past them. And in some cases, uh, the farther downstream the water flows, the more apparent the pattern is. Um, and so this is sort of the trait of historians. Other people, say people in the political world in particular, step into the stream facing upstream, and they have water in their face and foam, and they can't see a damn thing for more than about three inches. Uh, so they don't, you know, projecting patterns forward if you do not have a historical view of what they were in the past uh, really is almost impossible to do. Uh, as witness the thousand and one different interpretations, for example, of the Arab Spring and what may come next. Oh, great story. Um, all right, so, so I'm interested in the patterns uh, of the past. And obviously, in a world history textbook, uh, the structure of the book uh, implies patterns, even if they are not explicitly spelled out so that in the chapter I've asked you to read for this week, the one dealing with the Ottoman Empire, the Safavid Empire, and the Mughal Empire, as well as with uh, what I call the maritime uh, empires of Islam and the uh, European uh, extension into the Indian Ocean, uh, there's a question of what is, the, what is the underlying pattern that would um, that would uh, justify this kind of, of grouping of topics. Uh, there are a couple that are fairly obvious, but are not necessarily the ones that the authors had in mind. Uh, for example, is this simply talking about, um, uh, have a chapter to say, what were the Muslims doing uh, between 1500 and 1750? Is it just sort of grouping the Muslims? And since the Ottoman Empire and the Safavid Empire in Iran and the Mughal Empire in India were indeed uh, Islamic states uh, and were uh, arguably the most powerful and influential Islamic states, uh, you could say, well, yes, that, that is sort of what it is. But that, is, um, that was not what was in the minds of the authors when they carved out this chapter, uh, because there were, we were very conscious that there were uh, other parts of the Muslim world. Uh, for example, Morocco has a, um, a kingdom that is very robust this time. You have a number of um, very important Islamic polities arising in West Africa. Uh, and uh, you have Islamic polities in Central Asia, north of the Ottoman Empire and north of, the, uh, of Iran and um, uh, what now is Pakistan, but then was the northwest frontier of India. Uh, and these Islamic polities are not covered. So this is not meant to be what's happening with Islam between 1500 and 1750. There is the old rubric that I mentioned before, the notion of gunpowder empires. This was a phrase that was coined uh, by Marshall Hodson, who has written a very influential, very long, and not, well, uh, let's say an influential and long three-volume work called The Venture of Islam uh, that is highly admired in some quarters. And he said that this is a period in Islamic history. 
uh, that you have, you know, the sort of beginnings of Islam, then you have the classical caliphate, and then you have the collapse of the caliphate, and then you have the gunpowder empires. Uh, states that are implicitly power uh, defined by their uh, ability to exert power and conquer territory rather than by something explicitly ideological. As I mentioned uh, in a lecture previously, uh, one problem with this is that all of the empires of that time are gunpowder empires. The spread of military technology is terribly important all the way from uh, from Britain across to, uh, to Japan, uh, and the different ways in which uh, the, new, uh, the new weaponry become engrossed into the national culture and into the uh, uh, political and economic uh, institutions uh, will vary a good deal. And they vary among these three states, so that what you have in the Ottoman Empire really isn't quite the same as what you have in the Safavid Empire, what you have in the Mughal Empire. Uh, so I, I don't really like the, the phrase gunpowder empires. I don't think it gets you very far, except that it does uh, say implicitly that what is defining these states is more in the, uh, in the political military realm than in the religious ideological realm. I think there is substance to that. That is, say that the uh, that prior to the 13th century, Islamic states or states uh, had primarily a Muslim citizenry, had Muslim uh, rulers, uh, were uh, more oriented toward issues of ideology, uh, uh, religious legitimacy of the state, and so forth than these later Muslim states. And that's partly because there are changes in the, um, uh, in the political thinking within Islam that I will get to uh, as we move along. But again, gunpowder empires is not what we had in mind. Um, uh, early modern Muslim states was not what we had in mind. Uh, what was more germane in the author's thinking was the idea that you have a, an important distinction that seems to arise at this time and not earlier between uh, land empires and maritime empires. And that the, uh, these states represent a, um, uh, the continuation of land empires into a period which increasingly becomes dominated by, uh, by maritime power. So the fact that this a chapter includes uh, maritime sections in the later part of the chapter, but does not include the Muslim states of Central Asia that were contemporary with the Ottomans, contemporary with the Safavids and the Mughals, and indeed were for all three states, very important uh, historical and ethnic uh, touchstones because they were Turkic states in Central Asia. But those states in Central Asia did not have any, uh, any uh, seacoasts. So they are, by definition, not part of a growing uh, maritime world. Uh, last week, we, talk, we talked about, I talked about um, uh, Europe and uh, how we define it and so forth. Uh, next week, we have a chapter called Northern Eurasia, which will include Japan, China, and Russia. Um, but those, those Central Asian states, really, we never are going to talk about, but they don't show up in the book. Uh, and so now you get into a problem even though we were thinking in terms of land versus seaborne uh, power, uh, was there a subtext in which we were kind of anticipating that over the course of time, the Muslims of Central Asia would become part of Russia? 
In other words, were we not talking about um, uh, the Uzbeks or the Crimean Tatars uh, because we'd already kind of fallen into a, um, a 19th century model in which uh, Russia is already sort of granted a, uh, a hold over uh, much, much more extensive parts of Central Asia than they held, for example, in 1500. In 1500, not only was Russia not a Central Asian power, but it was uh, very, very strongly under the influence, if not the domination, of the Muslim uh, states of Central Asia that had initially uh, been set up uh, in the course of it in the aftermath of the uh, Mongol conquest of the 13th century. So, you know, from an American point of view, of course, during the Cold War, the idea that you had a Soviet empire and then you had things on the fringe of the Soviet empire, um, that becomes a standard theme. But my concern is whether we're reading back that sort of later thing into uh, this earlier time. Uh, there is a, you know, there, there are people who come up with grand theories uh, of uh, how the world works or how the world has worked, and these grand theories are um, pretty much always wrong. Uh, I've come up with a number of them myself. Um, but being wrong doesn't mean that something is not useful. Uh, indeed, um, sometimes some of the most important uh, questions that have been studied by historians have come into examination because of some wrong idea that a historian has put forward in a particularly uh, forceful fashion. So one of the ideas that you have that is uh, in question somewhat in this chapter is the heartland theory. Uh, there was an English geographer named Halford McKinder who came up with the heartland theory. He was a pioneer in the study of geography in Britain. Um, he was the first person to teach geography at Oxford uh, in the, um, before World War I. Um, he became a professor of geography at, and was one of the founding figures of the London School of Economics. And his work was, uh, was very influential. He died in 1947. So his work primarily deals with the pre-World War II era. He argued that um, there is the, the great world island, which today we would call Africa, the African Eurasian landmass. But he was focusing primarily on Eurasia. And then you have an inner series of islands around it, which would include, say, England and Japan. Then you have an outer series of islands that would include North and South America and Australia. Uh, but essentially, the world focuses on, on something in the center. And he calls that the heartland. Uh, in 1919, he wrote an essay on this. This is in the aftermath of World War I, in which he said, whoever, uh, whoever controls uh, the um, Eastern Europe uh, controls the heartland. Whoever controls the heartland controls the world island. Whoever controls the world island controls the world. And this thinking that identified a certain central part of Eurasia as the heartland, um, it, it was not a great idea. Uh, let me make it clear. I, I think he, he was wrong. Uh, 
But it was a very influential idea at the time. Uh, on the one hand, uh, German uh, theorists in the Nazi era took it up and said, this shows that we must conquer and assimilate Eastern Europe to, uh, to the, the Nazi Reich. Uh, Western Europe should be conquered, but Eastern Europe, and particularly going into Ukraine and uh, Caspian Sea area with its, at that time, uh, great oil resources, uh, that became a, um, uh, an important aspect of what was called the drive to the east, the Drang nach Osten. Um, from a British point of view, Mackinder argued that Britain is living in a fool's paradise if they think that they can remain powerful simply by uh, controlling the seas. And that controlling the seas uh, will not, in the long run, uh, succeed because what you need to do is to control the heartland. Now, for him, the heartland is uh, Central Asia, basically what is now uh, uh, what became the southern parts of Russia, then the southern parts of the Soviet Union, including Iran and Afghanistan. Uh, and um, his argument was that this area included a very high proportion of the world's significant resources, uh, that it was, uh, you could have land contact with every place so you don't have to go around everything, uh, and that it had great potential if it could ever be controlled by, uh, by people who had the vigor and the resources to, to make it work. So this was something that was very appealing to Soviet um, uh, thinkers uh, because they, they had the heartland. The question was what to, what to do with it. There are people now who look at the difficulty of carrying out a war in Afghanistan or the near impossibility of carrying out a war in Iran who say, well, you know, if we only had bases in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and uh, Kazakhstan and so forth, uh, we could do something. So the question of who controls the heartland now is still there. Uh, you also have um, increasingly, uh, it's increasingly evident that the resources of Central Asia, whether in terms of um, oil and gas from the Caspian Sea area or in terms of uh, minerals uh, from the mountains of Central Asia, that this is economically not only a crucial future area, but one that is sort of up for grabs because it's under a bunch of uh, very weak states and um, no power dominates it. Whereas McKinder said it's very important for, it, for, for the powers, whatever the powers may be, to see this as a place to dominate. I think implicit in this was the idea that this is where the Mongols had had their empire and that the Mongols had demonstrated as no one else ever had uh, the idea that if you put that inner together uh, you uh, have enormous uh, control in the world. Uh, the Mongols um, uh, did not survive as a uh, coherent state very much past 1300, uh, but they produced a number of, of um, states that were uh, influenced by the Mongols and uh, to some degree descended from the Mongols. So that the Ottoman Empire uh, was, uh, came into being um, uh, during the period of the, uh, of the late Mongols. And uh, in some degree saw a kind of legitimacy uh, in that Mongol, uh, uh, that Mongol century of rule from 1200 to 1300. The Ottoman ruling family had a fixed understanding that if the family ever died out, that 
the power in the Ottoman state would be taken over by the rulers of the Crimea, uh, or uh, what, what they called the, the Krim Tatars, who were a Turkish or a Turkic speaking population in what is now southern Ukraine, uh, ruled by a family, uh, the Girai family, who were descendants of Jacob. Um, the, uh, the Safavids had uh, risen in Iran uh, in the after of the Mongol period. Uh, there were uh, there was a Mongol population that ended up in the heart of Afghanistan, and in particular, the Mughal Empire in India is established by people who uh, claim descent from the rulers in Central Asia. So uh, the Mongols create an empire, they collapse, and then you have other states uh, appearing on the periphery of that empire, leaving the question of the center of the empire um, somewhat, uh, somewhat unresolved. I don't think that Mackinder's notion of a heartland works as geopolitics in the way in which he thought of it. But in some ways, it's a very helpful uh, reminder that uh, land connections uh, are not necessarily inferior to seaborne connections. In other words, you can always get to, uh, in the pre-modern period, get from China to, let us say, Paris faster by walking than by getting on a boat in the Yellow River and uh, going out into the, um, you know, uh, the Sea of Japan and down to the South China Sea and then into the Indian Ocean and then across the Indian Ocean and around Africa and up the Atlantic coast. And finally you get up to, uh, Spain and Western Europe, and then you can, you know, you can get on a pony and go to Paris. But um, these interior lines of connection are intrinsically uh, more um, more efficient than the peripheral lines of connection. So one of the questions that arises here is when we talk about uh, these empires, and particularly in the latter part of the chapter, the uh, the maritime aspects of the Islamic world at that time and the extension of European powers into the Indian Ocean, into areas like Indonesia. Um, is this, what do we read into this? Is this a, a matter that, uh, that the Europeans really did find a better way to, uh, to organize uh, political and military and ultimately economic power? Um, or do we focus on this maritime side uh, for other reasons? The argument for there being other reasons uh, is partly a historiographical one. That is to say, we have sources. The Dutch East India Company, which becomes uh, functional after 1600, and a bit later the, uh, the British East India Company, uh, produced huge archives. Uh, they did a lot of business, to be sure, uh, but they did not monopolize a business in these, uh, in these seas. There are also huge archives in Portugal uh, from the earlier stage uh, uh, of Portuguese influence in the Indian Ocean and um, Southeast Asia, going back to uh, Vasco da Gama's first sailing around Africa in the 15th century. So, um, so we have a lot of sources, and these sources are still uh, by no means uh, thoroughly explored. 
there just aren't that many people who can read 16th century Dutch handwriting. Um, there are, so far as I can tell, precisely two who work on this area, uh, scholars at least in the United States. And they're able to come out with book after book after book of completely new material, simply by reading through the archives of the Dutch East India Company. For the, for the heartland, uh, first of all, um, Russian is not a common language for uh, scholars in Europe and the United States. Uh, and this is partly a product of, of course, uh, Bolshevik Revolution and the Cold War, so that uh, Russian sources become um, less easily explored than, uh, than sources in Western European languages. Uh, also, uh, during the Soviet period, uh, you have a very strong ideological uh, slant imposed on Russian sources uh, by communist um, uh, dogma. Uh, and yet it's, it's fairly recently become clear that uh, once you get past that, those people who can work with Russian sources uh, and who are able to sort of um, see through the, uh, the ideological um, uh, distortions that affected stuff uh, written after the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, that there's material dealing with Central Asia uh, that probably will one day be worked into a much more, um, much more, a much more effective history, and people like the Uzbeks will no longer, and the Krim Tatars will no longer be sort of excluded from the story. Uh, this has been a very ideological issue. For example, we had for many years here at Columbia a professor who was probably the best uh, informed scholar in the country dealing with, uh, with materials written in Uzbek, which is a Turkic language um, written in Cyrillic script. Um, and through his efforts, the Columbia Library has perhaps the best collection in the country of uh, books and magazines, newspapers published during the Soviet period in Central Asia in local languages. But this gentleman was also a very ardent cold warrior and did not think that people should read anything in Russian dealing with these areas because anything in Russian would be distorted by Soviet um, uh, baloney. Uh, and so you had a division between uh, right here in, in, in this neighborhood. You'd have uh, one superb scholar who could tell you everything in the Uzbek sources and another one, I think he was at CCNY, I'm not sure, um, who had read all the Russian sources but couldn't read Uzbek. And so we never brought it together. Uh, and since the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the reluctance to recognize Central Asia as, a, as an area in the, uh, in the context of area studies, which had gone into sort of eclipse uh, after the fall, by the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, has still left this area very, very poorly understood. So uh, we have a, um, a problem of having a reservoir of historical studies for the Central Asian side of things comparable to what we have for the maritime side. And this leaves us with, um, with difficulty in sort of correcting for the errors or the biases that might have come into our view of things. In the very broad sense, uh, my personal interest in this, you didn't ask, but I'll tell you anyway, um, is embodied in, a, in an essay I finished writing last night for a conference this weekend called Welcome to the Camel Zone. Uh, I raise the question of um, why do we refer to, to parts of the world as zones? 
and whether uh, doing so is by assigning one word to a particular geographical area, uh, it's always going to be loaded one way or another. Uh, and so I said, for example, um, uh, we refer to, to Europe as being in the temperate zone. And temperate is such a nice, even, sensible word. Uh, as opposed to, let's say, Central Africa would be in the torrid zone or the tropical zone. And there you get a very different meaning for words like that. Um, you take the, the torrid zone in, uh, with its pejorative connotations, you take it down to the American Southwest and you call it the Sun Belt. And suddenly, instead of thinking of you know, endless perspiration and dying of thirst, you think of playing golf in Phoenix, and, uh, and the term just sort of gets turned around. Um, you could call Europe, instead of calling it the forest zone, you could call it the, uh, the temperate zone, you could call it the forest zone. Because Europe, uh, Western Europe, uh, like Manchuria and Japan, they're parallel in the Far East, were heavily forested areas. Uh, we don't call them the forest zone, uh, partly because, um, particularly in this time period, all the forests were cut down and you know, used for you know, charcoal or coke or things like that. So, uh, but forest zone would be a, a reasonable term to use. And of course, if you read Grimm's fairy tales, you know all about the European forest and what happens to little boys and girls who wander off into the forest and are never seen again. Um, but you could also call it the mud zone. If you're dealing with the history of transportation, the great abiding characteristic of Europe, of Western Europe, was that uh, you couldn't, that the roads were almost always impassable. They were, uh, you know, we have many, many, many accounts of how terrible the transportation is, and I've talked about that in this class before. So when I, I, I use the word camel zone as a, as a synonym for, uh, for what I call the free energy zone, that um, this is the area from uh, northwest China across to uh, the Atlantic Ocean and down to the borders of Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the area where the most important source of energy in the pre-modern period was essentially free because it was animal energy using animals that were raised by pastoral nomads. Pastoral nomads, here I'm going back to something I talked about last week, Pastoral nomads regard their livestock as wealth. Uh, a, uh, a cow or a horse is, you know, is like a, um, you know, a Deutschmark or a, uh, you know, a Kruger Rand or something. It simply is wealth. So you don't have material goods of an inanimate sort. You don't acquire coins, you don't acquire a lot of jewelry, you don't acquire real estate, you don't acquire uh, many things because as a pastoral nomad, you are on the move and you can't carry everything around with you. The question of how much you can acquire is, um, is relative to how much you're willing to schlep from one pasture uh, to another. So your wealth is not in in inanimate goods, uh, you know, jewels and coins, your wealth is in animate goods that can walk from place to place with you and you don't have to carry them. So the result is that the livestock that they raise in the camel zone is not, uh, is not proportional to the market for the livestock. In other words, this is the difference I was talking about in the Western Hemisphere where you develop ranching cultures, where it is the, the animals 
that you sell or the animal parts that you sell that determine your wealth. Simply having animals on your, on your land is not in and of itself uh, a clear marker of wealth. So you don't, have a, uh, you don't have herds that rise or fall because the market for uh, wool or for meat or for uh, any other uh, product of the herds uh, rises and falls because the value is, uh, is relative to your own uh, cultural assignment of value to the living animal as opposed to, uh, to simply the products of the animal or the parts of the animal. So the result is that people who live in this zone or on the borders of this zone come to use a tremendous amount of animal energy to carry goods or to haul goods or to operate uh, irrigation devices or, uh, or to uh, operate industrial uh, devices such as machines to crush sugar cane or uh, uh, machines to press linseed uh, and get linseed oil or something like that. Uh, they use the animals and the animals are very, very close to being free in terms of cost. But what I mean by that is that you, you do have to buy the animal, but once you buy it, you don't have to feed it. It seems odd, but uh, the animal uh, is bred on land that cannot be used for agriculture, desert or semi-desert or uh, long grass steppe lands in Central Asia. It grows to maturity with no dollar cost, as we would phrase it. Uh, so the animal is it's a source of wealth for the, uh, for the pastoralist who owns the animal, but it's not a uh, it hasn't cost anything in, uh, in financial terms to, to raise the animal. So now you take the animal, uh, you go to a market and you buy the animal. Uh, the animal can now live on, uh, on, on desert grazing. Uh, because in most parts of the camel zone, you are very limited in your agricultural land, but you have a lot of wasteland. Uh, and you can put animals out to graze. There was a <coughs> study done by a University of Pennsylvania economist and several colleagues in Pakistan in 1985 that asked the question of why do you have camel carts uh, in use in Karachi and other big cities in Pakistan? And they did an economic study of it and concluded the reason is that a camel cart can compete economically with a Suzuki mini truck or with a gasoline powered uh, irrigation device or a sugar cane device, a pressing device, something like that, uh, because it is so cheap. And a budget was actually published as part of this article. Um, the costs to the person who rents out the camel. And it had, you know, uh, let's say 200 laboring days per year, cost of feed zero, um, 100 uh, laboring days, uh, non laboring days a year, cost of feed zero. Uh, then you had the cost of the harness, which was, I think, 50 rupees. Uh, which is basically nothing. Then the cost of medicines, uh, which traditionally would have been uh, much less than they are now. And then you had the, um, the replacement cost of the animal. When the animal uh, is worn out and dies, then you have to replace it. So there you had the, amortiza the amortization uh, over a certain number of years for the prospective lifetime of the animal. And you added it all up, and you looked at what you could rent out the camel for in the labor market, and you found out that uh, 
that it was much more efficient than a gasoline operated uh, device. And therefore you continue to have uh, camel carts pulling loads because it's efficient. Uh, that would apply pretty much throughout the camel zone to camels and donkeys, uh, less so to, uh, to horses. Um, uh, but over many areas, particularly in Central Asia, it would apply to horses as well. It does not apply to mules at all because mules are sterile and therefore they are of no intrinsic value as living animals. They are only of value uh, as, uh, as they are used. So you don't produce a mule and say, hey, I have 150 mules, aren't I rich? You'll say, yeah, you have 150 mules, they're going to grow old and die, and then you won't have any mules at all. That isn't, that isn't wealth. It doesn't have any panty interest, so to speak. So mules you had to breed and, um, and sell. So a mule train is always more expensive than a camel caravan. So the result is that for, let us say, from 300 BC or so down to around 1700, here in this chapter with the uh, the cost of transportation overland in the camel zone is, uh, is the lowest in the world. It's incredibly inexpensive to carry goods from one place to another, particularly in comparison to costs in the mud zone in Europe, where carrying goods from one place to another overland is so expensive uh, and so difficult that you have people digging so they can carry them by boat and then uh, later on uh, building railroads so they could get over the problem of, uh, of the, uh, the rainfall um, muddying up the track. So now there's a problem. Uh, it's often observed that the maritime trade uh, supplants the overland caravan trade of Eurasia in this period. And that may be true, but I've never seen it uh, spelled out very Did it really become cheaper to have things go by boat from India to uh, Portugal, around Africa, or from India to England, or to Africa. Well, yes, then you get the, the question of the other factors involved, such as uh, safety. Um, what you have for maritime trade is the growth of insurance, uh, and the growth of shared risk in the form of joint stock companies. And undoubtedly, uh, those two things, after 1600, uh, you know, make the cost of maritime uh, transport uh, cheaper. You also have the growth of, uh, of market transparency, although that comes al along rather slowly. If you go back to the pre-1500 period, uh, traders tended to know what was the price they could get for something in a particular market. But prices were never posted. Uh, it was not a public, it was not a transparent market. The reason traders knew what price they could hope to get was because they had an associate who wrote to them from that market and told them what the price was, uh, or they had had some recent experience themselves, uh, or they had experience with um, the seasonal character of certain markets that if you bring uh, goods from one place to another at the right point in the year, They'll sell for a high price, but if you miss that window by a couple of months, the price will collapse. Uh, markets were extremely opaque. Uh, this was uh, a situation that gave a peculiar benefit 
or advantage to merchants who were uh, locked into, uh, or not locked into, but who benefited from uh, inside information. So sometimes is referred to as the ethnic division of trade, so that Jewish merchants would send letters to other Jewish merchants saying, you know, you know dear old brother Avram, if you get here before November, you'll be able to sell um, your coffee beans at a good price. Uh, but that would only be for with people within the network. Or you'd have Armenians. Um, Armenian trade networks were, became terribly important, particularly in Iran, all the way to Paris. So that the first coffee houses in Paris are run by Armenians with Iranian connections who know what the prices are uh, in different places. You have a Hindu trade network uh, in this period so that uh, Hindus uh, sell goods, uh, you know, buy goods in India, sell them for transport northward from the Persian Gulf up to the Black Sea, and they have an interior uh, communication system. There are actually places in southwestern Iran, far, far, far away from India, where there are certain caves and you go in and the walls are covered with uh, Shaivite Hindu religious uh, writings because they were uh, places of religious uh, significance to people in the Hindu trade network. Um, Muslims of different sorts can have a trading uh, network. So that as long as you had uh, no transparency in the markets, there was an advantage to having a um, um, ethnic uh, connection. Well, that ethnic connection becomes replaced, or not replaced, but supplemented or complemented, in the European case, by the company. So that the, this massive quantity of correspondence that we have for the East India Company or the uh, Dutch East India Company um, this mass amount of correspondence is the equivalent of the, the letters that, uh, that a Jew in Baghdad would write to a colleague in Bombay uh, or to a colleague in uh, Livorno in, in Italy talking about the nature of things. Uh, eventually, once the Europeans gain further control, uh, they, uh, they stipulate prices and they try to force everyone to uh, to buy and sell at the prices that the company has, has designated. And so over the course of this period, you have a disappearance of, uh, of this, not a total disappearance, but a diminishing of this ethnic um, division of commerce and a growth of, uh, of markets that are transparent but are also fixed. Uh, this in turn leads to um, uh, to swindling, you know, piracy, things like that. Particularly agents of the European companies that do a little trading on their side, on the side at a higher price. Uh, all the customary uh, you know, deficiencies of a of a fixed market system. So. Um, the intrinsic uh, economy of land transport in the camel zone is now being challenged by changes in the maritime commercial area. The safety is actually greater overland. Uh, boats can sink. Uh, if a camel dies, you take the things off and you put it on another camel. You, uh, you, you, can't, you can't have your entire cargo sink in the, you know, on dry land. So, so, there is, so there is safety. So one of the questions 
that arises is, does the, uh, what it seems to be quite uh, probably uh, clear is that long distance trade over land diminishes relative to maritime trade in this period. Um, is this because of the new institutions that the Europeans set up in the joint stock companies and insurance and so on? Uh, or is it because they capture certain um, strong points where they can control the trade and ultimately set the prices? And then after setting the prices, then they eventually embark at the very end of the period onto plantation economies where they grow the goods and control the price that way. Uh, is this what happened? Navigation. Hmm? navigation. Well, navigation doesn't change a whole lot in this period. It, you, can't, you cannot shorten uh, by navigation the distance from China to England if you have to go around Africa. Ultimately, you build the Suez Canal, but that's not until 1869. Yes, uh, nav you, you can have some, some marginal improvements in, uh, in navigation. Uh, you can build uh, larger boats and so on. But the, the basic economy of the overland transport uh, uh, remains. Um, for shorter distance, uh, transport, not going from China across the old Silk Road to, to Europe, but within a state, within the Ottoman Empire or within the Safavid state in Iran or within Mughal India, uh, the economy of, uh, of overland commerce uh, remains, uh, remains strong. That is to say, we have lots of commerce that goes up from the Persian Gulf to the Black Sea overland through Iran uh, that does not go around Africa because it's just a lot shorter and a lot cheaper. The states that are involved, the Ottoman state and the Safavid state and the Mughal state have comparatively, well, let, let's say not minimal interests in what's happening in the maritime realm, but rather um, uh, changing interests. Uh, the Mughal Empire rules most of India and has no navy. Uh, they are interested in trade, but they're perfectly happy to see uh, the English or the Dutch or anyone else, the Portuguese, uh, do the transporting. So we, we, we produce products, we sell these products to foreign merchants, the merchants take them away and sell them somewhere else and that's fine with us. They don't feel they have to have a navy to protect their, themselves from these uh, people. Um, the same thing with Iran. Uh, Iran has essentially no navy uh, except for some very brief moments. At one point when Iran wishes to expand its imperial reach to go to Bahrain or to Oman, on the other side of the Persian Gulf, they're perfectly happy to, um, to ask the Dutch or the British to carry them across in their boats because they don't have uh, their own shipping. Uh, there, you know, as with the Indians, as with the Muslims in India, the, under the Mughals, uh, they seem to see the world in terms of the interior lines of communication and to under uh, underappreciate the change that are taking place in the maritime realm. For the Ottoman Empire, uh, this was for a long time considered to be uh, the same case as well. But just recently there is a uh, some new work by a, a scholar at the University of Minnesota named Giancarlo Casale that, um, that focuses upon efforts that the Ottomans seem to have made um, to extend 
Ottoman power into the Indian Ocean and through the Red Sea. Uh, he has found a surprising amount of information uh, to show that the Ottomans down through, say, the 1560s or so, uh, really did try to, uh, to be as adventurous in the Indian Ocean as the Europeans were being at the same time in uh, the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic. In other words, that the, the era of discovery was not exclusively a European era, but it was an era that the Ottomans shared in. Uh, and then you get a, that comes to an end uh, by, the, um, by the late 1500s, in the same way that a parallel effort in China to explore um, uh, you know, new areas by sea uh, comes to an end. Uh, interestingly, when the Ottoman effort to extend power into the Indian Ocean uh, comes to an end, you have a new plan, which they have, which never comes to fruition, which is to build a canal uh, that would connect, that would go through what is now southern Russia. And it would connect the Don River, which flows into the Black Sea, with the Volga River, which flows into the Caspian Sea. And the project for a Volga-Don Canal would have made it possible for someone to, uh, to go from uh, the Mediterranean uh, all the way to the northern coast of Iran on the Caspian Sea. And it would have been possible to have a maritime route by using canals that would have been uh, immeasurably shorter than the routes that uh, the Dutch and the Portuguese and the English were using that had to go around Africa. Uh, in Soviet times, this canal was eventually uh, built, but it was not completed during the Ottoman period. But it, it reflected, Casali argues, and I think it's, it's fairly, uh, uh, fairly clear that this is sound, that it, it showed a, um, some consideration of the relative advantages of handling your commerce in one fashion or handling yourself in another, handling another fashion so that the Ottomans were trying to achieve a maritime route to Eastern products, namely those from Iran, particularly silk, that would be entirely through Muslim territories until they got to the Mediterranean, as opposed to having them trade out of the Persian Gulf and travel around Africa. Um, so it's not completely a negative story with respect to, uh, to maritime enterprise. Uh, but it is one of, the, uh, one of the general lessons that we tend to teach dealing with uh, challenges like this, which is that these early modern Muslim land empires uh, showed a um, kind of a surprisingly, a surprising uh, lack of awareness of what was happening in the, um, uh, in the maritime world where the Europeans were gaining more and more, uh, more, and more strength and more and more confidence. Uh, and the question is whether this was a, a lack of awareness that was, uh, was because they just weren't very on the ball or whether they saw things having other alternatives having to do with the continuation or extension of, um, of overland uh, trade options that were intrinsically cheaper than the maritime ones. Uh, this has gotten involved in a debate which is a very, not a wonderfully um, productive debate, but a very active debate uh, in the field of uh, Middle Eastern history, which is a debate over uh, did you have a decline of the Muslim world? 
Uh, most people in the country who teach about the Middle East as their specialty uh, will bristle at the word decline. It's as if these are two syllables that are just horrible syllables uh, because they seem to have a, um, uh, an implication that Islamic society was inferior to Christian society. Uh, the issue of decline has drawn out highly ideological um, uh, scholarship uh, on both sides. Some people arguing that it's very clear that the Europeans were just a, a hell of a lot smarter and more inventive and aggressive and better than the Muslims and the Muslims uh, preferred to sit around in their harem and you know smoke water pipes and dream of glory days that were long past. Uh, this is the version of the decline theory that uh, Edward Said was particularly exercised by, saying that this is decline as a substitute for racist um, uh, disparagement of non-Western peoples. Uh, there are other people who say, well, decline needs to be treated in a nuanced fashion. That, uh, on the one hand, did the Ottoman and Safavid and Mughal empires experience decline? Uh, recently I heard uh, Giancarlo Casale say, you know, all those empires disappeared, so I guess they declined. Uh, unless you can just, you know, go directly to fall without passing through decline on the way. Um, so, so you can't, you can't utterly eliminate the notion of decline. Uh, and other scholars have pointed out that uh, that the Arab world, in its literature, has talked about decline for a long time. So that the word for decline in Hitat uh, shows up. Oh, So that they'll say, well, you know, Arabic poetry really declined after, let us say, 1200. And we haven't had any poets since then of the caliber of the earlier poets, except some individuals now in the 20th century. Uh, although very often when they talk about decline, they also will explain why. Say, well, the reason we had decline was that we came under the control of the Turks. And, uh, and therefore, we were laboring under imperialist domination. Uh, the rulers were Turkish. Uh, they didn't understand Arabic very well. You know, poetry comes when you have patrons who are great masters of uh, the language and appreciate the high quality poetry and uh, you just didn't, didn't have it, and therefore you had decline. Um, nowadays, particularly with the warming of relations between the, uh, the current Republic of Turkey and the world, I think we'll hear less and less about how terrible the Turks were and how oppressive they were. Um, because this, like arguments dealing uh, with the Muslim world, is strongly inflected by, uh, by ideology. So, um, you, have three, you have three states. Uh, an Ottoman state, which is uh, by population majority non-Muslim. A, a Mughal state, which is by population majority non-Muslim. Let us say you have four uh, more Christians in the Ottoman Empire than Hindus in the Mughal state than you have Muslims. And a Safavid state that is 5% um, Muslim. Uh, great homogeneity there, 
and um, uh, great heterogeneity in the other two. Uh, the Ottomans and the Mughals are both Sunni states. The Safavids are Shiite states. So you have a pronounced difference between, um, between these in, in religious terms. Uh, you have a basically homogeneous Shiite state versus uh, you know, great heterogeneity in the surrounding uh, Muslim states, the bordering Muslim states. If you were to go into Central Asia and include the Khanates of the Crimea and, uh, and the Uzbeks north of Iran, uh, again, you would have Sunni um, states, although more homogeneously uh, Muslim than either the Ottomans um, or the Hindus. Um, all three of these states were glorious. If you, can, if, if you could have gone to Istanbul in you know, 1530 uh, or to Isfahan in you know, 1600 or 1630 or to uh, Delhi or Agra, the heyday of the Mughal Empire, uh, and you, you compared it with the best that Europe had to offer at that time in terms of glorious um, artistic urban life, uh, you would have said these are magnificent uh, states. We have uh, abundant travel accounts of Europeans who went and they were sort of overawed uh, by many, uh, particularly of the capital cities. So one of the problems with the decline narrative is that the people at the time who went there um, usually didn't see it that way. They saw these as wealthy, um, thriving empires that, um, that Europeans might in one way or another emulate, except for the fact that they did not believe in the Christian faith. Uh, so this is, is part of the problem, that the decline narrative looks at thriving, successful, wealthy uh, capital cities and says, ah, but they are, they are edging into decline. Um, and then trying to define exactly what it is that is causing that. I know many Americans feel that way now about the United States and say, you know, this is really a great country, a great society where wealthy and some of us are really, really wealthy, um, but aren't we kind of edging into decline? And uh, isn't there um, something about, say, the projection of our debt over the next 30 years or the, uh, the rise of China or um, the uh, impending change in the climate or disappearance of affordable gasoline or something? Uh, aren't there things that are, that are pushing us into a uh, an incipient, uh, an incipient decline. Uh, well, you know, if this this depends on your 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 party affiliation and your your, your taste for gloom, uh, whether you fall into this kind of uh, this way of thinking. But um, but the uh, the comparison here is that when we look at this period from 1500 to 1750 and look at these three uh, these three states uh, how much of the historical construction that we put on this history is the result of hindsight now are we grouping them and uh, defining the, their several crises that they've had um, because we know that uh, that they are going to uh, that they're going to come to an end, um, and this is 
exclusion of the central region part of the camel zone because we know that it's all going to end up under the control of the Russians uh, and uh, end up in sort of a post-Soviet uh, state of uh, uh, chaos and disorder. Um, do we need to, to, um, to remind ourselves that uh, historical objectivity should include some sort of um, guarding against an, an over uh, an over reading of the hindsight that we have because we know what's going to to come later. Um, in some ways, it's it's easier to write about the Roman Empire, where everybody knows that um, that it is going to fall. Uh, and you can appreciate it at its heyday uh, than it is to uh, to write about these states where you know there appears to be so much um, ideological baggage accompanied with the question of whether they are uh, at the pinnacle of something or whether in a post pinnacle moment where their fall is not yet uh, fully appreciated. Um, this has been an extremely uh, uh, general lecture, as it's quite obvious, um, and I will talk on Thursday in, uh, on, on some issues that are more particular within this, particularly the, uh, the nature of the crises that appear to have occurred in the uh, area of taxation, landholding, and, uh, and changes in the military. Thank you.